Now, the theme that I want us to look at this morning is this, a gospel-driven partnership, a gospel-driven partnership, and we will be looking at Philippians chapter 1 and verses 3 to 8, but because we shall be coming back, back to verse number 6, God willing, next week, we shall skip that verse and then uh, consider it in our next sermon, verse number 6. So we shall look at verses 3 to 8, skipping verse number 6, so that we give it the attention that it deserves. Now, just to put us to perspective in terms of what we shall be addressing ourselves to, let me indulge you on the matter of friendship and associations and relationships that we have around. It could be that you became friends with someone because you have a shared interest, shared common interest. Sometimes you go to a facility to receive a service and there seems to be some negligence or just some lack of organization, some disorganization, and one of the people to be served begins to complain. And then you're sitting next to them. Then as soon as they begin to complain, you also join in and say, so you have also been seeing the same problem. I've been here in this facility for three hours. No one is here to serve us. Then you just spark a, a friendship there and then. You never planned to become friends. You just met, you have a shared problem, you talk about it. Then the conversation is sparked. Or maybe because you have a common enemy. So they begin to talk about some bad politician that they hate. And then you also join in. I also, I don't like that person. And then as the conversation continues, you begin to be friends. You never plan to be friends at all. But some will become friends because you have a common enemy. I don't know whether you, you have had such friends in your life. Or maybe because of a shared hobby, an interest maybe in life. You, have, you, you love football. You both are you know, supporters of football teams. I'm told there's Manchester and Arsenal. There's Chelsea and name it. And so you begin to converse and you have a shared common interest. You both love football. Or in this part of the country, we have Gorma here, the Kogalo team, isn't it? You meet on a Saturday to go and cheer up your team because you love your team. And so you become friends, not because you plan to be friends, but because you have a shared common interest. Maybe because you have a shared past. You may have had a similar alma mater, okay? Similar high school, the Alliance High School. Recently, some of the politicians were just remind, reminding themselves of the, you know, down the memory line of the times at Alliance High School, when education was education. When going to school was going to school, not like these days. And then you begin to go down the memory line. Could that be the reason we are in this church? Is that the reason we are friends in this place? Is it a common hobby? Is it a common sport that we love, that we are here? Is it because of common experience we had in the past that we are you know, friends in this place and we fellowship and we, we, you know, uh, we partner in this particular place? What is the reason? What is the chief reason that I never knew you, that you existed somehow? You came from some corner of the world. You came from some tribe in this nation. You came from some background that is probably not known to me. But today we find ourselves fellowshipping together. Maybe your context was different from mine. Your salvation experience was different from mine. But somehow today we are friends and we are in this church together. What is it that brings us together? That is our sermon for today. Paul has something he shares in common with the Philippians. And the Philippians themselves likewise have something that they share in common. There is this story told by Dr. Luke in the book of Acts and chapter 16 of a lady called Lydia, a seller of purple goods, a worshiper of God. The Bible says, 
that she was the first to have been converted in the land of Philippi when the gospel went to Macedonia. She was a business lady selling purple goods. You, you basically begin to understand that she was rich. Those days, if you could sell purple goods or even purchase them, they were bought by royalties. Kings would be the ones who put on purple goods. But just as the scene is going on, it, it, it shifts again, the camera shifts of Dr. Luke, and we begin to focus on another man called the Philippian jail. All right? This is a government employee, what you call a civil servant, working for the government of Rome. He is a guard in a prison. He's been told to secure these two individuals who are causing havoc in the city, a colony of Rome. Gospel finds him there when the Apostle Paul and Silas are locked up in prison. He hears of the gospel and he asks the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they tell him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. Different experiences altogether. In the case of the Philippian jailer, he even hears of the earthquakes in prison. Now, not said about Lydia. Different experiences, different backgrounds, different jobs and careers. One is a business person, one is a, one is a government employee. They believe they be, become members of this church at Philippi. What is it that brought these two people together with their families? Now, you turn to chapter number two, you meet a man called Epaphrosidas. In there, in chapter number 25, in chapter 2, verse number 25, this man that was a member of this church that they sent to Apostle Paul is called Epaphroditus. You move to chapter number 4, in verse number 2, you have Yodia and Syntyche and Clement, members of this church. We know quite a few of them. We know of Epaphroditus, we know of Yodia, we know of Syntyche, we know of Clement, we know of Lydia and the household, we know of the Philippian jailer. Different backgrounds. What is it that brought them together? The Apostle Paul is going to help us to understand that the foundation of their friendship and of their fellowship was Christ. This is what we have here. Now begin to think of that today. Why is it that you have something in common? What do we have in common between you? Why are we members of this church? Why are we even friends? You never knew I existed, did you? I never knew I existed. For some of you, I'm, I first met you here at GBC. Today we are friends. The same hope, the same Christ. Why? Then to see that today. Now, just to describe this kind of friendship, the Apostle Paul uses a word that is very rare in Greek called koinonia. Sometimes the word is translated to mean fellowship. Sometimes it is translated to mean partnership. Sometimes it, is, it means participation or sharing, depending on the version of the Bible that you use. In this context of the ESV, the Apostle Paul chooses to use the word partnership. Some of your copies in verse number 5, you use the word fellowship or participation. Sometimes it will use the word sharing. The biblical term for what brings us together is in the Bible is called fellowship, participation, partnership, sharing, koinonia. It is different from being friends because you come from the same tribe. It is different from becoming friends because you have a similar hobby, an activity that brings us together, a past that we must go back down the memory line and bring to remembrance. Biblically, this word koinonia means to share something in common and we want to establish what is it that we share in common. The most important thing in this universe that all of us in this church, if we ever Christians, we share in common. Put aside our hobbies, put aside our tribes, put aside our languages, put aside our backgrounds, put aside Everything that you can love, 
and preferences. What is it if you strip us of all those things will bring us together? One thing, the one, the most important thing, the primary thing that brings all of us together. What is it? This is the word used in the Bible called koinone. Partnership, a share. And so Paul in these verses is going to help us to appreciate that whatever brings you know, him together with the church at Philippi and whatever brings Lydia and Syntyche and Clement and Judea and the jailer is koinonia. So he wants us to pause a bit and remember and reflect on that word and the intensity and the gravity of that word and its implications for a church like this where we gather today. Read with me verse 3 up to 5. It says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. The reason is in verse number five, because of your partnership in the gospel. Do you have it there? The reason he is praying to God and he does so in every prayer that he offers to God with joy is because of his partnership with the church at Philippi in the gospel. There you have the reason. What is it that brings us together? The gospel. A partnership in the gospel. A fellowship, if you like, in the gospel. A sharing in the gospel. A participation in the gospel. Hope is can bring us together, but they're temporary. A business can bring us together, but they're temporary. A school can bring us together, but that's temporary. But what is it that ultimately brings people from diversities, Gentiles and Jews, whites and blacks, races, different, you know, upbringings together permanently and glues them? The partnership in the gospel. This, first of all, as we, those who are writing, is the first point. The foundation of true partnership is the gospel. The foundation of true partnership is the gospel. In other words, we are saying that the gospel is the ground and goal of true partnership. If ever we need something that will bring true partnership, true fellowship, true participation, true sharing, it is the gospel. What is the gospel, brothers and sisters? The gospel declares to us the good news about Christ Jesus. We all have bad news. Those of us who watch TV, so just a few weeks ago, that TV was filled with bad news. Man to man, isn't it? Hopelessness, shops closed. People are despairing. What becomes of my business? What becomes of my, you know, my situation, my condition? I can't go to the hospital. What happens to me? What happens to my son away from home? What happens to this world of ours? Because the economy is crumbling. The politicians are at war. There's nothing that is stable. The worst of it is sin. We remember our sins and we are sinners. We ask ourselves, how is it? That somehow, at the end of eternity, at the end of the day, we shall be partakers of eternity with Christ Jesus. That we shall go to heaven because hell and heaven are their own destinies. We realize that we are sinners, just like the Philippian jailer and Lydia and Clement and Syntyche, and these people realize that they have a common denominator, a common problem. Now, sometimes those who have money may not feel the gravity of the economy like the politicians, but you will fail it. So you don't have a common problem, do we? No. But it's a common problem for us all, which is our sin. This common problem requires a common solution. And so we discovered that God in his own majesty has given us of something of a common solution, that this common solution is pronounced only in the gospel of Christ. So that we look at the glory of Christ in the gospel. 
We remember of how damned you are, how wicked and wretched you are. And we remember that God has promised salvation and redemption in the person and work of his son. And there we have something in common. A common solution to our common problem. We may not have many common problems, but we have one. Same. We may not have common aspirations together, common ambitions in this life. We may not have common interests, all of us, but there's something that ultimately brings us together, the gospel of salvation. So he tells them, I thank my God. In all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, making every my prayer with, with joy. It is with joy. He is happy to pray because he has a common bond with them, the gospel, the partnership of the gospel. Surely, what else can bring joy apart from the gospel in this world? Tell me if there's something that you can share in common with you today that is so precious, that is, is so urgent and important apart from the gospel that declares to us the solution to our problem, sin. The blessedness of eternity in Christ. Because sooner rather than later you're going to die. We shall leave everything here on earth. In other words, these other interests are only temporal, isn't it? For how long will you be supporters of Arsenal? For how long will you remember of the days in Alliance High School? For how long will you remember of the meals you used to share together, the times you had together? For how long, brothers and sisters? Because you're mortal. But there's something that glues us together internally, the gospel. Because it brings us into a union with the one who lives eternally. It brings us to Christ when we believe in him, when we have faith in the only savior of humanity, we become alive. The Bible says that God made us alive together with him. Alive forever. In other words, we live forever in the person of Christ. That Christ becomes the only thing we share in common, forever. Every other thing perishes. Today, if our friendship ends, for whatever reason, there's something that remains. A good thing, permanent thing, the gospel. Christ. Christ remains because Christ is the eternal God. The one who died and rose again from the dead. All other people who would have been our friends who brought us together because sometimes you can become friends because you have a common friend, isn't it? What if they die? But Christ died and rose from the dead on the third day. And he told us victoriously that now I am going to the Father. And I shall make a dwelling place for you, and I shall come for you. But there where I am, you shall be also, to be them forever. What is it that brings us together? The gospel. That is the ground of our true fellowship. That is the goal of our fellowship. This is the point of convergence, the gospel. We pursue a common interest the gospel. And so look at what the Apostle Paul says in verse number five. When he prays, he prays with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Philippians would have had so many reasons to partner with the Apostle Paul. They would have had so many things to bring you know, these people together with the Apostle Paul, although he was a Jew. But the one thing that united them to the Apostle Paul was the gospel. They partnered with him in so far as the gospel is concerned. Now, look at the Apostle Paul and his interest in the gospel so that you appreciate that this is a person who is consumed the gospel. Look at, for example, verse number 12 to 14. He is about the gospel. That is his life. He lives for the gospel. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He will repeat the gospel. What has happened to me in prison has served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the entire imperial guard and who and to all the rest that is that my imprisonment.
discernment is for Christ. The gospel. Christ is the reason I'm in jail. Look at verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. That is his joy. That is his motivation. That although he's suffering in the prisons, in the walls of prison, the Caesarean prison, the walls that were quite, you know, outrageous. This man says, I am so happy. I ought to be weeping. I ought to be languishing here. I ought to be miserable. But I am not miserable because what is happening within the walls of prison is something that is tremendous. The gospel is hard. It is not bound. And he's happy about it. Look at verse 15 and to 17. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from good will. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for defense of the gospel. Again, the gospel is there. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Now, look at verse 18, his conclusion. What then? Only that in every way, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. What is the Apostle Paul's joy? The gospel. That is it. That's why he's telling them that I'm so happy that it has pleased God that we may partner in that gospel. That's the point. You laugh what I laugh. The gospel cherishes my heart. It does to you. It has brought us together. And you are concerned about it. You are confident. The only thing that remember the Philippians is the gospel. And you are willing to partner with me in that. In other words, he's telling them that you love the gospel the way I do. Look at what it tells them in verse number 7. Verse number 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. How many times is the word gospel mentioned in this chapter? Just the chapter alone. You begin to see why right, the, the, the apostle Paul is writing the gospel. That is his interest in life. This is what makes him happy and joyous. And so he is so joyous that whatever makes him happy, his goal in life is being bought by the Philippians. They love what he loves. So he says, I'm so joyous. When I'm praying, this is the only time the Bible says the Apostle Paul prayed joyously. <laughs> All right? He prayed for the churches. But here he prayed the joy. Because the interest of the Philippians would resonate with his own interest. Similar interest. You can imagine how happy you are. Have you ever met someone, probably, just like we went back and gave examples. Someone you share in a common interest. You are happy. Sometimes you are lost as you've been, been to discuss the past. The person next to you doesn't understand why you are lost. You forget about them for some time. And then you tell them, oh, sorry. We're just remembering of our old school days. They are just they are beautiful. Is lost in the gospel. And he's happy that these people are partnering with him in that very gospel of salvation. The gospel of Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is the point. The greatest pursuit and the common interest in life that we should have is the success of that gospel. If there be anything that brings us together, it must be the gospel. It is the very message that brought us together in the first place. It must be the message and its proclamation that binds us together until all eternity. We could be asking ourselves, what is the specific nature of this partnership here in verse 5? He mentioned this in chapter number 4. He will explain himself what he means by this partnership in chapter number 4. Let's go there and see what he means by this partnership he's talking about, especially in verse number 14, chapter 4 and verse number 14. The nature of this 
partnership, share. What is this that share in common? It says, yet it was kind of you to share. This is that word? To share my trouble. And you Philippians, yourselves know that in the beginning of what? The gospel. How many times is, this, is it mentioned? <laughs> That's the point. That And you Philippians, yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership. There the word is. Fellowship. But special. No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Now you understand the reason he's joyous. He says the only church in Macedonia that wanted this gospel to prosper was the church at Philippi. So he's happy. And he's joyous about it. Look at verse 16. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. This is the people he's writing to. A shared common interest. This is a church whose concern for the gospel made them to sacrifice their you know, comfort, to sacrifice their happiness for the sake of the gospel, that the gospel may, be, may be, be go forth unhindered and be honored by people because people are lost in their sins and Christ must be glorified. So they ask themselves, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. There goes a confession that is a pursuit in life. So they sacrifice their comfort. They would have had better uses for the money because they are supporting financially. These people had needs. It is not that they had abundance. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, we are told that they gave out of their poverty. Okay? Very poor church. But because of the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, the defense of the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel, whether in prison or outside of the bounds of prison, they say, we shall sacrifice our comfort. We shall sacrifice our needs. We shall put the gospel as a priority because we are serving the interests of Christ as of first importance. Surely, let's ask ourselves a question today. What is it that is of at most importance other than Christ Jesus? If you're a Christian. What is that so, is so important to you than Christ in this life? I don't have. Maybe you, don't, you have another one. Yes, I have children. I have a wife. I have a family. I have friends in this world. But what is it that takes priority in my life and in my life? That it, if it means sacrificing anything to see it successful, I can do so. For Philippians, it was the gospel. So they look at the poverty and they say, poverty will not end us from giving so that the gospel goes forth. It always says in 2 Corinthians 8 that they gave out of their poverty and beyond their ability and within their ability. So that the Apostle Paul can preach the gospel. So that they can hear the news. That the gospel is prosperous. People are coming to salvation. Christ receives the bride that he paid the price for. Friends, can we describe ourselves as having a common interest in this church? Can we say that our fellowship, our partnership, our sharing together, our participation in this church, GBC Kisumu, is the gospel? Can that be said of us today? Is that the one thing that brings us together? That when I meet Brother Joseph, whatever he thinks about and I think about and we can talk about, we can fellowship over, is the gospel. It's the point. I'm saying that because the word fellowship has been taken out of context nowadays today. You go for tea dates, okay? I'm told it's coffee dates, okay? Or pizza dates. And then you say, we went to fellowship. What fellowship? Fellowship, eating pizza is fellowship. The foundation of the true fellowship is the gospel, both on its ground and its goal. Let me say that again. 
the gospel is the ground and goal of true fellowship. If we meet together and the intention for our meeting is the gospel, that is fellowship. But to talk about the glories of the gospel, to talk about the joys of the gospel, to marvel at Christ's work of, on the cross of Calvary and the furtherance of that truth, that's fellowship. So when you meet brothers and sisters and you want to call it fellowship, ask yourself, who is the reason and the foundation for your conversation and fellowship? Is it Christ? Or you simply met, gossiped a bit about someone and then said, what a wonderful, wonderful fellowship you have. All right? It's a very wonderful fellowship. What a wonderful fellowship. Oh, we were very happy because you have missed one another, isn't it? And so when we met, we had, and what, what a wonderful fellowship. Ask yourself, was Christ at the center of that conversation? That's the point. Was your preoccupation at that particular time Christ Jesus? Was that your pursuit? Were you burning with a pursuit, a common interest that Christ be honored in that meeting and Christ be honored in terms of the fatherness of his truth to the four corners of the earth? That is what we call fellowship. Christ is the sum and substance of fellowship. In biblical terms, Christ is what defines fellowship. Nothing else. Any other thing is a caricature, a distortion of the the truth of fellowship. It must be Christ or the the reason you are meeting. So that he can be lifted now. So today, if we meet here and we say we we fellowship today in this church, when we leave this place, we must ask ourselves, what was the basis of a meeting and who was being exalted in that meeting? If we did exalt Christ, we fellowship. But we must proceed quickly and see the frequency of that partnership. We are asking ourselves, how can we know a gospel-driven partnership or fellowship or sharing? Or participation. How can you know? First of all, it's foundation. The gospel must be its foundation and its ground and its goal. Secondly, observe the frequency of this true fellowship. For it to be true that we can talk about fellowship, it is not a once a one-off thing. Look at verse number five again. We always thank God. Verse three, the Father. Sorry. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Look at what follows. From the first day until now. What is the frequency? From the time they met at Philippi until the time Apostle Paul is in prison. Historians say it, it may have been over 10 years when the letter was written back. He still knows their names. He knows Epaphroditus, he knows Clement, he knows Syntyche, he knows, he knows you know, all these names. He remembers them by name. He has to show the bond that was developed between them. He still remembers them dearly. And he says, you have been in partnership, in sharing, in participation with me as I preach this gospel from the time I set foot on Philippi until now. The frequency that, so that it, becomes, it becomes a fellowship. Because fellowship is sustained. It's not a one and off. It is not intermittent, is the point I'm making. It is not occasional. It is not when it's favorable, convenient, or when you have time. It is sustained. That's why, for example, in, this, in our church today, we ensure that we meet at least once a week, all right? Here. Because it is only fellowship if it is sustained. What do you call friendship if it's not sustained? The opposite of friendship is acquaintance, isn't it? Fellowship. 
the frequency. They began to fellowship from the day he went to Philippi until the present time. Remember the time at Lydia's house? Lydia is converted. She is baptized to the household. Then she you know, prevails over the Apostle Paul and the commandments and tells them that if you deem me faithful, please do come to my house and stay with me. Share of my blessings. Share of my belongings as we preach this gospel. And so the gospel is preached from my house. When they go to the house of the Philippian jailer, the Bible says that he took them because they were beaten to Paul and he cleaned them. And they had, you know, some, some time in his house. And that continued today. Now, so that you know that it continues today, look at, for example, in chapter number four, where we are again, back to chapter number four. Verse number 18. Chapter 4, verse number 18. He says, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. A fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Even right now, he's still in prison and they have sent Epaphroditus. That's why he says, you have been in partnership with me in the gospel from the time I was in Philippi until now. They still remember him. They still talk to him. Look at what he said about this amazing fellowship. Look at uh, what uh, you know, Epaphras did in chapter number 2. Chapter number 2 and verse 25. About the gift that this man had to sacrifice his time and life to take to Paul. 2 and verse 25. The Bible says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger. They sent him, okay? And minister to my need. They sent him to minister to him in prison. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also me also, lest I should have, should have sorrow upon sorrow. Why? Verse 28. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may receive, may rejoice at seeing him again, that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor, such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in a service to me. So Epaphrodus is sent to the Apostle Paul's imprisonment. He's going with some gift. Somehow along the way, some illness comes to him. He nearly dies as he delivers this help to Paul. Yet, when he recovers, he goes, continues the journey. He still goes to prison and he tells Paul of what happened on the way. Brother, I nearly died when I was bringing this gift to you. And it remains with him for a while. Surely, isn't that fellowship? What can bring such commitment if you're not Christ? That someone risks, that's what he said in verse number 29, he risked his life to go to where the Apostle Paul was. The gospel is the only message, the only truth that can make us be selfless, self-giving, sacrificial, because it comes to the love of God. Now, back to chapter number one. Just so that you see, in the third place, the fruit of this true partnership. You have seen its foundation. You have seen its frequency. Let's observe the fruit of this true partnership. The fruit. What comes out of it? Is there some good that comes out of this fellowship? Is it in vain? Again, let's read now up to verse number 8. Verse number 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all 
because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with affection of Christ Jesus. Look at the fruit there mentioned in verse number 7. What good comes from this gospel partnership? It says, black and white, they are all partakers with the poly of grace. All of them. It says, verse number 7, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace. When they partner participate, share with Paul in the gospel proclamation and defense, they all become partakers of the grace of God. All. Maybe you missed the word all. It says, for you all. No one in this church is left out. Because they all participated. And that's why he said in verse number 4, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy. In verse number 8, it says, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with affection of Christ Jesus. All of them. This is a corporate affair. This is not an individual affair. See the point? So that the fruit is shared amongst the church. No one is seeking his own interest in this one. A church corporately receives and enjoys of the benefit of the partnership. It doesn't matter who gives what. Ultimately, they share the, the fruit. The corporate nature of this blessing. I mean, I'm saying that because in our world today, sometimes in some circles, sadly so, baffles us. If ever the man of God knows those who are pillars of the church and he knows how much they give, he shall treat them differently. There are some that are very closer to him now because they give more. The Apostle Paul says, I'm praying for you all. And you are, all of you are part partakers with me because all of you have participated in partnership. No one is limited here. No one is left out. There goes our motivation. There goes our incentive. Why do we partner with the gospel? So that we become partakers of the grace. Now, what does the apostle Paul mean here? It means that the participating in the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel and its defense is a work of grace no one can boast about it. If ever someone is involved in the gospel work, it is because of God's grace. He himself, as the Apostle Paul, he does not boast about it. It is a work of grace for him to preach. So that if anyone joins hands with him to preach this gospel by supporting the gospel, he's joining a work of grace. And you know what happens when grace is mentioned? No one takes credit. So he's they are sharing in this special privilege. It is a privilege to proclaim the gospel because what is the most important message a sinner should hear? The gospel, Christ. So imagine bearing the most important message to take it to the world, the lost sinner. This is no mean task. It's better than being a president of this nation, better than being a judge, Better than being anything you can, you can admire, being an engineer. This is the most important work to proclaim the gospel. So it says it's a special privilege you have that you share with me in this work. This is the point. So that when God will you know, bring Paul to an account and look at the blessing of his ministry, the many churches he planted, because after Philippians he plants another church in Macedonia, the Philippians will be counted as having participated. Though they never physically went to those places, but God counts them as having participated. 
those church planting out. That's why it's a privilege. If I go somewhere and I preach, someone does not go, but there's a sense in which we are united in this, in prayer, in whatever means we are supporting this ministry, that which comes out of it, the fruit of it, is not mine. God counts and credits us to all of us. Turn to chapter 4 again and see. The word used is a counting word, credit. Chapter 4. And in verse number 17. The Apostle Paul says, I am not looking for money. I am not a prosperity gospel preacher, okay? <laughs> Paraphrase of chapter 4, verse 17. I am not a prosperity gospel preacher. So it says in verse 17, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. So that in your credit, something may be put by God, counted by God as something you did in obedience. Because you persuaded me, with me. You are with me in doing this in the smallest way possible. We are talking about the fruit of partnership. Why do we do it? It's for good. So that God credits this accounting term. Something is added to my account and your account when you participate, you partner in the gospel of Christ. God counts as though we have participated with Christ and the apostles in the proclamation of the gospel, the forwarding of the gospel, that it goes forth. Do you think that's a privilege? That although only one of us can go to preach the gospel and support him in some way, that result is counted for all of us. Is that a privilege? That it is not him alone that will be said to have obeyed the, the call of the gospel, but all of us will be counted as having participated. And so that's why he encourages them that, brothers, I am so jealous about what we're doing because your concern is still not my concern. Although you can't accompany me to preach the gospel, you participate in ensuring that I proceed to preach it. You pray, never in prayer for me. You never in supporting me that I may go and preach it. So that we may share of the grace that comes from it. So that if there be some reward that God gives, we share that reward. I was, I'm told in the earlier days, I don't know whether it still happens, those who are a bit elderly, like I can, may give us an experience. People would go hunting. And sometimes the animal would be so little like a hare. And only one person's club would hit it. I'm told that some of them would find a way of sharing that animal. Even those who did not do throw a club on it. Simply because they went hunting. They can't come back, you know, uh, empty-handed. The Apostle Paul is telling us, that if ever we support the work of the gospel, not supporting the man of God, the gospel, God is pleased and, decided, and, and, and delighted. And he counts that to us as credit. I don't have another motivation to give you. I'm not a motivational speaker, okay? <laughs> but if ever the reason why the funds are given is that gospel may go forth. That the glory of Christ will shine forth in this world. That sinners may see him for who he is and can say that I was lost but now I'm found. That I was blind but now I see. If they ever confess because we participated in that, then God counts for credit. Because in doing so, as the gospel goes forth as fragrance, Christ receives the glory. People obey him and honor him, and they confess him, and they worship him. Imagine a case whereby the gospel is preached across this nation, and as many churches as possible are planted, solid churches, and they gather to worship Christ, and something like this. Who receives the glory? Christ. 
was as many as possible. He receives the bride. As many as possible. Worship. What is a pursuit in life? What should be the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. To see that our Christ is not just glorified in Kisumu, in our houses, even elsewhere, he is being glorified. People are worshipping him. That it must sadden us that we see others still worshipping, you know, Baal. The Muslims are still worshipping their Allah. The Buddhists are worshipping their, you know, religion. And all these religions, it should sadden us. We should desire to ask ourselves, how shall we take the gospel to them? That they may turn from those idols and worship Christ. That when they do so, Christ may be glorified. If that becomes our pursuit, then that's fellowship. That is genuine partnership. Now we're on the right track. See the point? Now we're on the right track. Because our desire is now to glorify who? Christ. Not to glorify the man of God. Not to make him whatever you want to make him. That I may have a personal jet. I don't, have a, I don't want a personal jet, please. Please don't buy me a personal jet. I don't have a helipad. <laughs> Pack it. I don't need it. What I need is an opportunity that God grants that the word of God may go forth and honored by sinners that they may see Christ and honor him and turn to him and they plead with him for salvation and he saves them. If that becomes my pursuit and your pursuit, then we partner in it, then we glorify God. That's partnership. I hope that you begin to have a different perspective of fellowship, okay? Christ is the fellowship. Is the self-substance of it. The foundation of it. Is the goal of it. Our pursuit should be to glorify Christ. We should ask ourselves always when we meet, brothers and sisters, how should we glorify Christ better in our neighborhood? Someone can tell me, Pastor, can you take fellowship in my house so that I can invite my neighbors that they may come to that fellowship and hear the gospel? That's true partnership. Because your pursuit is Christ to be glorified. Pastor, I have neighbors. Can I please invite them to church that they may hear the gospel? That's partnership. Pastor, can we gather that we can pray that sinners see Christ for who he is and come to him? That's partnership. May we be a church that partners that ultimately, not our church, not the people serving this church, but only Christ, who is the sense of the gospel, be glorified. Amen.